Okay, that's recording. Tell me when you're ready. Uh, yeah. Okay. And we're away. Looks good. Tim, I've had another one of those moments where I've had one of my podcast ideas at the very last minute, just as we're about to call. I'm like, oh, this is a good idea, which means either it's a great idea or I haven't had time to think it through and realise, oh, no, this is not a good idea. (laughs) You're lucky, though, because thinking things through helps you refine your ideas. The more I think about mine, the more excited I get, and they're just as likely to to die. <laughs> I think it's worse for you. I think you overthink it and then you yeah. start thinking, how can I make this more worthy and, you know, more wholesome? And, and you, like you start like building all this unnecessary goodness into it. You just got to go, just got to just follow your heart, follow your instinct. Well, my heart is good. That's the thing. Don't think. If you think, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Career advice for Tim Hyde. Just don't think. Yeah. Got to be like a Top Gun pilot. You just like, you take the shot. Just all the training kicks in. I just have to trust that all my comedy training kicks in at this point. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Comedy training. So anyway, just before we uh, started recording, I was listening to the Jurassic Park theme. Nice. There's actually this YouTube video I found that plays the Jurassic Park theme over and over again for an hour, just back to back to back to back. (laughs) Oh, I love it. So uh, nice. Because it's such great, it's such great background music, isn't it? Like it's so Mm. inspiring. Oh yeah. So I had this idea for a podcast called the Jurassic Podcast, right? And what happens is. Whatever you discuss, whether it's an idea for a podcast like you and I do or anecdotes or whatever you're talking, has to be told in like a sort of a three minute time frame or however long the theme is. Mm. And it has to be told with the Jurassic Park theme in the background. Yeah, right. So it's like, so, so, so so it just shows that anything's made better. So, for example, say I was telling you a story about something that happened this week and I would say, well, I woke up and it was a bit of a dreary day. And we have the horns just gently playing in the background at the start, that lone horn. And then I'm like, and then I bumped into my mate Dave at Sainsbury's while I was doing my shopping. And the music just slightly picks up and hints that something's coming. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then like, it just builds up and we decided we were going to go and play tennis. And we went out and played tennis. And maybe you could use that first climax that that it has, you know. Yeah. And then it speeds up and I could tell you about the tennis we were playing and what happened and how the score unfolds. And at the end, when I tell you the result, you have the big bang climactic thing. And it, just any story would be made better with the Jurassic Park theme. Just everything, everything's told. Sports results, sports reports, news reports, anything you want to talk about. Anything is better with John Williams' Jurassic Park playing in the background. That's nice. I like it. It would it would it would help some of my ideas. Just to bring full circle, yeah. I think some of my ideas would be a lot better if they had the Jurassic Park theme. It's hard to tear something down when it's being presented to you with the <laughs> Jurassic Park theme. Play. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> the um, did I send you that video? There's this. I've I've told you about this before, but we did it the other day, and I videoed it, but I can't remember if I sent it to you. I think I yeah I did. There's this, uh, there's this drive around Zoo Park near where we live with lions and stuff in it. And you drive your car through it and the lions and the monkeys and stuff come right up to your car. But at the start, there's these giant gates you go through. And every time we drive through them, we put the Jurassic Park theme on the car stereo and just jack it up all the way to the top. <laughs> Welcome to Jurassic Park driving. It's long leap the place is called. Nice. Do you ever you ever consider a bit of Jurassic Park in the background when you're giving a sermon? I was thinking not when I get, when I was giving a sermon. That's great. <laughs> I often think about it when I take my glasses off. So when I, I I carry sunglasses around my my neck and then I swap them obviously as I come in and out of sunlight, get in and out of the car and so forth. But I often think about taking them off in that way that Sam Neil does. You know when he sees them for the first time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love the act of... Has there ever been a more overacted taking off of sunglasses scene in the history of... The most amazing thing is that the um, is that the most famous taking on and off of sunglasses or the, the most famous taking off of sunglasses scene isn't from a Top Gun movie. It's, it's the Top Gun glasses, <laughs> but it's like looking at dinosaurs. <laughs> it's a classic. So I often I, I think there of that is. when I take them on and off. I thought of it again the other day as well. There was something happening, and I was, and I thought of the, the Jurassic Park theme. It just, it's, it's 
it's in my mind clearly. Like as much as remember oh. Jaws was in our mind when we'd go through the swimming pool and mm. and we'd make the dern mm. and noise. Jurassic Park comes to mind so often. I love it. Brilliant. I love it. One of the rare albums that I owned on cassette and then CD as well, and that I now stream. I haven't got it on vinyl, nice. but I have had it on all three, all those three. I, I didn't have it on cassette. I definitely had it the CD, and I definitely listened to it at least once every few weeks. We have some parish notices. You mentioned that when you bought your KFC to break the fast at... was it Which KFC did you go to? Was it Malvin or...? Mitchum. Mitchum, sorry. Mitchum yep. KFC. They didn't have any buckets in stock. That's right. Deepest Descent on Reddit said we were given a bucket at Golden Grove KFC yesterday without asking. Right. We ordered a giant feast. So if you're willing to drive down to Golden Grove, which is a, a suburb in Adelaide, Tim, it sounds like you can get buckets there. There's Well, I wonder if they're just working through their last few buckets, though, or if they've been regularly given mm. more. Is there something Golden about... Golden Grove does strike me more as a bucket kind of KFC <laughs> place than Mitchum, to be fair. Not to, not to make judgments. <laughs> it is. It's a long way to drive for a bucket. But it'd be, and I'm not going to go test the theory. But it would be interesting to know if they're continuing to source some outlets with, with buckets and then are deliberately taking them away from other places. Yeah, maybe they've just realised where the buckets are popular. It could mm. be. Another thing, Tim, I, I've been reflecting on your breaking of your fast. And um, I was looking at the pictures you sent and I noted that you were drinking a glass of wine with your KFC. Mm. Yes. I particularly noted it was red wine. Mm. And I was wondering, does one drink red wine with chicken? <laughs> I thought it was white wine with chicken. Well, that's something only distributed <laughs> at the Mitchum KFC, actually. <laughs> <laughs> buckets yeah. are out uh, Unless they're ice buckets In which case you can get champagne And white wine and red wine Now I don't know I think surely with fried chicken Red wine is a good accompanying drink Some people say look you drink whatever wine you like With whatever meat you like Most people will say white wine with white meat As far as I've read Lighter meat Mm. And the and the reds come in when the meat gets a bit darker. Mm. So it depends it depends where you read. But I would have thought. I mean, I'm not judging because I'm a red wine man. I don't really like white wine. But I did think it was an interesting choice, the red wine with the uh, chicken. And I wondered if you wanted to elaborate in any way. Well, to be fair on the guests, I didn't bring the wine. I brought the chicken, and someone else brought the wine. So I, I right. don't. And I know that person listens to the podcast. So I'm not going to complain about the wine. Um, and it was right. fine. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Remember the other yeah. day when we had KFC? I'm not sure about your choice of wine. I mean, it's getting a little bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps a Sauvignon Blanc would have been nicer. But um, I, I, there's something in my mind that red wine, if you're eating something fatty, red wine kind of burns up some of the fat, which I think is probably ridiculous. But it's mm. probably just adding sugar on top of the fat. But just to my mind, it's um, better than a, better than having a sun kissed, which is what KFC will provide. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying the the wine makes it healthier? Yes. And now that yeah. I'm saying that out loud, that doesn't seem as plausible. But <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I had eight pieces of KFC, but it's okay. I had five glasses of red wine with it. <laughs> as long as you're not driving, you're in tip top shape. That's right. <laughs> I'm sure there's something you could... Maybe the fries soak up the alcohol so then you can drive. I don't know. I'm sure <laughs> you've got keep, some logic just, going on there. Just keep eating. Just keep eating. <laughs> oh, golly. It did get me thinking about red wine, this whole train of thought. And then a question came to mind that I thought maybe you could answer. Mm. You know how in churches you do communion and traditionally you, you could have red wine to represent the blood of Christ, as I understand it? Yes. When churches obtain the red wine to give to their parishioners can you use just anything like a like a bottle of wolf blast or is there like specific communion wine that churches buy from specific suppliers that's a good question actually i mean you can use whatever you want you tend to use a sort of a fortified kind of wine rather than say a shiraz or something like that there is a place out at clare that's like a catholic retreat center and they it's also a winery and they make wine and people tend to get it from there so everyone tends right. to get their stuff from there. Um, well, not like the Vatican. You mean in Adelaide? Yeah, in Adelaide. That's right. Clare. That's right. Yeah, Just yeah, north yeah, of Adelaide. Yeah. Of course, some listeners yeah. listening all around the world may not know where Clare is. So, yes, you're right to correct yeah. me there. <laughs> but, like, but like other churches don't get it from Clare, like churches around the world, but they, 
but they might get it from also from church suppliers. No, that's right. That's right. So I imagine there are probably, well, the Catholic Church is probably a classic on this. It probably has um, places, I'm trying to think of the name of this, Seven Hill. There we go. Seven Hill Winery up uh, in the Clare Valley. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you can Mm. just buy normal wine from there. Oh, absolutely. Seven Hill Wine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just go there and get wine. They they produce it. But they also happen to be the people who who people get a lot of their um, so-called sacred wine from. But, of course, you can use... Um, people use both alcoholic and non-alcoholic uh, juice as well. In fact, in a lot of communities where there are people who are struggling with alcoholism, just tasting alcohol at church is not going to be helpful for them. So you might have yeah. both or you might have one or the other. Yeah, like Ribena or something. Yeah, yeah. Although you're not allowed to. Out, out, it, the instructions in, in the Uniting Church book specifically says not Ribena. So it should be grape juice and Ribena is too artificial. So it, it what's black currant? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. So it specifically says not Ribena, like it says the brand. Oh. The brand. <laughs> in the, the, in one, the, the one thing I chose, <laughs> yeah. But that's because everyone chooses it as a default because it looks kind of the most like blood. Whereas grape juice, of course, if it's a white grape, it's going to be white. Because Ribena looks like Jesus's blood. <laughs> Imagine Jesus at the Last Supper. Hand me that wine. No, not the Ribena. <laughs> it's, no, it's not Ribena, not Ribena. Judas. <laughs> Judas. <laughs> Put that Ribena away. Get out of here. I see what you're doing. I remember one guy leading communion in our church years ago, 20 years ago, and, and we had, we had um, what are the communities where people, some people struggle with alcohol, so we had non-alcoholic and alcoholic, and you could line up in a different line depending on what you wanted. And... Um, hmm. And I remember the guy who was leading communion, uh, Frank, said, um, he goes, we've got both alcoholic and non-alcoholic today, country and western. <laughs> Which is a great, 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 great line to throw into the middle of church. Does the Uniting Church Handbook say anything about the bread? Like you can use any bread but not tip top? Well, <laughs> uh, I, I would suggest not, yeah, not wonder, wonder what, tip top wonder white, just bouncing away. Um <laughs> You can use whatever bread you want. Yeah, yeah. Right. Often it's generally it would have been unleavened bread, you know, so without yeast and a flat mm. bread back being the Middle East. Brown or white or seeded. Yes. Unseeded. It can be. Yes. Yes. Could you you could you use that yummy raisin toast, like that bread that's got sultanas through it? I love raisin toast. The 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 danger with starting to move into the more um the the point is not about the bread. So you know, <laughs> Unlike a cooking show where you're trying to focus people on the food, in communion you're trying yeah. to just see the, 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 the food as the signs of something greater. So you're actually getting them to not concentrate on 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 the bread. At morning tea, you can go for your life, but, but okay. at the ceremony it's a bit different. I would have thought raisin toast might be good, though, because then you can do the bread and the grape in one. Very good. Yes, you can. Mm. Yes. Mm. Very good. I'm just thinking. I'm no, always that's, thinking. That's, that's always good. That's good. Should have had the Jurassic Park music. Like, play, we, should, we should have. I'll, I'll put the Jurassic Park music under that. It'll sound way more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking the questions. Um, All right. Very good. Thank very you for good. that. How do we get onto that? Oh, wine, KFC. Yes. Right. Yes. How, how do we get onto it? I don't know how we got onto it, but I know it started with KFC somehow. It did. As always. It did, yep. So KFC <laughs> and a glass of wine. Had a letter here from Peter in Germany. You remember, Tim, in a, in a recent episode, you had the idea about interesting housemates that you lived with. Mm. Here's, a, here's, a, here's a message. Uh, Dear Tim and Brady, your latest episode made me remember a housemate I had back in the day. Here we go. My housemate during my university days was a nice guy, but sometimes when I climbed up the stairs to the fourth floor up to our apartment and already on the second floor, I was confronted with an offensive smell. I knew. Oh, no. It's starting again. In front of our apartment door lay, or should I better say decomposed, one or two cow skins fresh from the butcher. My roommate, who was about 40 years old, was actually adept in the traditional art of building djembe drums. Djembe drums? I'm sorry, I don't know the pronunciation. What followed was usually, the next morning he explained to me that from now on I could not use the shower for a day or two. This was because the skins were lying in it, soaking in something. The smell did not get better. In the next step, he nailed them onto wooden boards and put them on the rain gutters in front of the windows to dry. Every time I went to the kitchen window, the sky darkened because a cloud of flies rose from the skins. 
After that, he would sit in his room for days and string the drums. Fortunately, we had an iron rule. He never played the drums in the apartment. <laughs> also want to thank you. I'm not a big podcast guy, but I never miss an unmade episode. Great work. From Pieter in Germany. Well, thank you, Pieter. How'd you like that? Look, I'd be happy to listen to drumming all day long as long as I didn't get a bloody skin inside the house. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's crazy. Decomposing skins. Oh, wow. Anyway, thank you very much. Ideas for podcasts. That's what we do here. Tim, what have you been cooking up? Hang on, let me start. Let me start the music. Well, let me tell you, the. I think this... Now I, now I want to go with the music. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to build up and then I'm going to take off my glasses at the right seat. You won't believe it, but my idea is about films. My idea is called Cinema Story. And it always strikes me as a little bit strange. You go to the cinema to watch film, which we've done all our life, and it's a wonderful thing. It's just weird when you stop and look around and realise we're sitting... I'm sitting in a room with a whole bunch of people just facing a wall. And it's... When you think about <laughs> how peculiar that is and you do it for two hours without talking to anyone, you're just staring at a wall. It's an incredible thing what they put up on that wall to keep us enraptured for all that time. But... It's a very dark room and largely you don't see it or pay much attention to it, but you tend to have favourite aspects and a lot of pressure in the cinema and what cinema you like is down to the comfort of the chairs and how nice the foyer is. Because when we spend about 10 minutes in the foyer and then we go into a dark room and watch a film and then we come and go, oh, I love that cinema. That's a wonderful cinema. I love lining up, buying something and walking into a dark room in that cinema because it's such a special place <laughs> and there's so many wonderful memories. <laughs> this is called Cinema Story. This podcast is people telling the stories about their film rooms, the cinema rooms, their favourite cinemas, worst cinemas, first cinema Cinema they've seen the most films in across their life and their favourite cinema. Love it. I love this. Being being a big film goer, especially in my younger days, I've talked before about when my dad was a movie critic, so I used to go to the movies a lot to watch movies with him. This really resonates with me because I've got quite a few favourite cinemas and places I like going. I would I would enjoy this podcast very much. Tell me, where, this, where does it all start for you? Where, where did you see your first film? I can't remember that. Films have been so much a part of my life. Like there were the three there were three main cinemas in the city center that I would always go to, you know, with dad where he was seeing films. So I in the order that I liked them, my favorite was the Academy oh, Cinema yes. on High Marsh Square, uh, which isn't there anymore. And then my next favorite was probably what well, the Greater Union that was down on Hindley Street. Yep. Uh I quite I quite liked. I never liked the Hoyts one off Rundle Mall very much because the cinemas were all split apart by shops and stuff, but mm. that was the third one. Obviously, later on in life, I really grew to love the Piccadilly Cinema at North Adelaide because mm. I lived near it and it's a very old-fashioned, beautiful cinema, so that's a real favourite. That's probably my actual favourite. It's recently been refurbished as well. It's just opened again and they've done a wonderful job inside. It's really nice. And Glenelg Cinema I went to a bit as a kid. Although I lived near Glenelg, I didn't go there as often as you'd think, but Glenelg Cinema I obviously have... A lot of memories of too. Do you have a regular cinema now that you go to as your default? Yeah, I I live near a very very lovely old fashioned cinema now, which I really enjoy going to. It's so old fashioned. They actually have uh, in front of the screen they have this old fashioned organ that rises out of the floor, and then oh, when the film nice. starts, it goes back into the floor. Yeah. And before the film starts, it rises out of the floor, and some old volunteer from the town comes and plays old fashioned <laughs> tunes on the organ. <laughs> So it's like really, really old school. So it's a really lovely, uh, lovely old cinema. Oh, that's nice. Which which room, which cinema do you think you've seen the most films in? I would say Cinema One, the big screen at the Academy Cinema in High Marsh Square, which no longer exists. I would have been to the most times. I, do you know that's what I put down for me too? I think I've seen the most mm. films through the through the for you the eighties, I guess, but for me the nineties. Um, just saw lots and lots. It's obviously not there anymore. It's replaced by the hotel. It's been built on the same spot, which is where you stayed when you came in and had to do that lock-in, um, lockdown sort of quarantine time. When I was staying in that hotel during my quarantine in Adelaide, one, I was doing a daily blog, and one of my daily blogs was all about the fact that that cinema used to be there, and I dug up old pictures of it and all sorts. So I'll link people to that blog post, and they can, they can read a bit about it. 
I, I thought you were going to give me some old cinemas from Traugan, some old country, you know, country cinemas. Well, that would be my first. The Academy's where I saw the most because we didn't go to the movies very much. It was a really big deal to go to the movies in Traugan. There was no cinema in Traugan. We had to go to the next town over, which was called Morwell, and they had a, a Hoyt's twin. I saw my first film there, which was Inner Space. Do you remember Inner Space? I do, yeah. Martin Short. Yeah. Uh, Dennis Quaid. Yes. Yeah. Meg Ryan too, wasn't it? Oh, you're right. I think that is Meg Ryan. I didn't remember that. A Spielberg sort of produced kind of thing. Um, yeah. Where one guy's injected into the body of another in a little space probe that's made really, really microscopic and goes into his bloodstream and travels all over his body, which is quite a good premise yeah. now I say it. But, yeah, I thought that was amazing. Yeah. I thought it was incredible just to be seeing a film it was just it was just phenomenal. And the only reason I got to see it is because I delivered newspapers um, three nights a week. I was a newspaper boy. And once a year, the, the newspaper would put on a special um, film and um, for all the newspaper boys in the Gippsland sort of area. And so I would go, I'd go along. We got a bottle of Coke and a popcorn and we got to see a film. And I thought that was like... <laughs> The most ama- amazing thing ever. Like, that was better than Christmas. That was incredible. So, <laughs> I love it. That's how I got to go to the cinema for the first time. Of course, time. the real game changer was when they built the big multiplex cinema at our very own Marion Shopping Centre, which was our favourite place as kids. Yeah. And they built the Megaplex. How many screens was the Megaplex? Look, it, it was... It was mind-blowing. It was, it was way too it was many. Like 12 or... No, no, no. It was like 36 or something stupid. Oh, was it? It, it was, was... it was some number that was inconceivable it was... to me. Like, it was, this was being built in Adelaide. I felt like we were the centre of the universe when they built this huge... And you could go there, and there were just so many screens. You yes. couldn't believe it. It was, there it was, was like nothing you'd seen. It was like one, two, three, four, five. Uh, yeah, there were. There were like 15 down each side, left and right. Yeah. And there was. I don't think there's that many anymore. Until then, I don't think there was a cinema in Adelaide that had more than three. No, that's right. Well, the, oh. there were five at that Grady Union in Hindley Street. But I, the, oh, right. but I fifth, yeah. I, I'm not sure about that fifth one. I never saw it. It was just... <laughs> <laughs> It's a rumour that it was <laughs> the word yeah. the five appeared on their promotional stuff, but no one actually really saw that fifth that fifth dark little yeah. one. But um, yeah, yeah that was oh, I saw a lot incre- of films when there. that opened. It was incredible. Yeah, oh, and it was so high tech. <laughs> like all the you'd go you'd line up for your tickets, and there were all those electric screens telling you what movies were what, on and yeah. what times. And there were so many times. Yeah, yeah, like you could. You could just you could just see a film almost any time you chose. That's right. You didn't just have to wait till seven o'clock that night. I remember when Titanic was playing, and it was like playing at nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one, two, three. You know what I mean? In different <laughs> screens all over, and they've all got about four people oh. in there. Golly gosh! Yeah. What's the worst cinema you've ever been to? The worst cinema you've sat in, a f- in to see a film. It's a good question. I don't know if an answer is springing to mind. Have you got one? Yeah, I reckon the worst one is that one on Henley Beach Road where we saw Copycat. With It was you and me and we're up the back. It's a long, thin one on Henley Beach Road. It's not there anymore. And mm. it was kind of like vinyl chairs that we were kind of stuck to and they were those old ones uh. so they're really thin. And it was like the movie was further away. So it was like smaller than if I was sitting in my lounge room with, <laughs> TV even mm. back then and we saw Copycat which is not a good film with Harry Connick Jr and oh. that was it was hot there was no air conditioning and that was not a good film experience that would be the worst cinema I often find movie theatres in America are a bit grubbier and not as nice as in Australia like I think in Australia going to the movies is considered quite posh and fun and like that, that they've got people to clean things and they yeah. keep everything clean and shiny and all the banisters are shiny but in America I think sometimes the cinemas feel a bit understaffed and grubby right I don't particularly like going to the movies in America I don't think I ever have been to the movies in America what about your favorite cinema is your favorite cinema of all time one of the nostalgic ones or this nice one that you're in at the moment? Uh, I, I'd probably choose a cat, the Academy Centre on High on My Square again just because so many memories, so many great memories of you and I seeing films, me and my dad seeing films, that little video arcade up on the yeah. corner they had where you could play video games. Yeah. And there were heaps of games, weren't there? There were heaps of arcade games, like 20 of them or something. Yeah. yeah. I love a cinema in Adelaide called The Mercury, Not, but it's only because it plays lovely old films. It only plays retro films. 
and I really love it. And apparently there's like a funding question over it at the moment, but I really, so if anyone's listening that has any authority in this matter, I love the Mercury Cinema. But I think my favourite cinema is our regular one now, which is the Palace Nova in Rundle Street. That's been, that we go to that a lot. And there's, the best thing about going to the cinema in Adelaide is there's no one else there. It's always, it's always quiet. So there's always <laughs> heaps of space to sort of spread out and you don't have to book specific seats and stuff. And that's, there's a coffee shop nearby. And yeah, that's probably my favourite. When did you last go to the Megaplex at Marion? I, have, I, I was, we were at Marion the other day shopping because the girls needed something. And I had time just to walk around, you know, kill time. And I looked at it and went up the escalator just to have a look and stood around looking at it and then, then left and remembered. But I haven't seen a film there since I took the girls there when they were little and na- they were staying at Nan's nearby or something like that. I think with Nan we went once. Yeah. That's a long time ago. It's exactly the same. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of anything with the word mega or plex. Like it's, <laughs> it is a little bit like bring the checkbook to buy the popcorn, you know, that kind of <laughs> yeah. massive, massive sort of. Um, we would definitely love to hear from civilians. If you've got cinema stories, favorite cinemas, things you want to tell us about, send us a message unmadefm at gmail.com or Reddit and Twitter and all the usual places. And uh, we might share some next week. And a photo too. Love to see a photo of the cinema. You don't have many photos from the cinema though. Like, because who takes a camera to the cinema and it's really dark? I guess not from back in the day. That's right. You don't really. Do people these days take pictures in the cinema? I mean, even now, like, you know. Not in the cinema. I have a mobile phone now and I... I don't. I get, you do it out the front. When people go see a theatre show, they take a photo of the theatre show. They don't tend to do it with a movie, do they? Like, no. Nah. Well, the that's movie. different if it's a theatre show because you paid a lot of money for the ticket and you only do that, you know, once every couple of years. Fair enough. All right, drop the photo idea. Don't play any Jurassic music over that photo idea because it's not worthy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> play the, play the, um, the, the Star Wars... Um, What's it? March of the... Dum, bum, the Imperial March. The Imperial March. That's yeah. it. Play that uh, over That's the, the bad That's idea. That's the bad idea music. Yes. All right. Well, now it's time for... Prune of the Week. Prune of the Week. Oh, finally. Nice. Prune of the Week. Now, you know... We like a good dried plum here on the Unmade Podcast. We do. We love a plum. There are so many species of prune that we can talk about. In fact, as you, as most people probably know, there are more than a thousand species of plums that can be turned into prunes. Most of them are European varietals. Mm-hmm. Almost all prunes, particularly in the United States, are made from this one variety of prune, this one cultivar, and... It's time to talk about it. It's the one everyone will want to hear about, and that is the improved French prune. Improved French. Hmm. Mm, Sometimes it's called French improved, but we'll go with improved French. This is what most, across California, which is the prune capital of the world, 99% of America's prunes come from California. 70% of the world's prunes come from California. No way. And almost all of them are improved French so, obviously, that's something to talk about on Prune of the Week. Well, is there is there imp- improved French? Does that mean it's like it was French, but this version has been improved on the French? Or is it sort of it's been improved because it's been made a bit more French? Is it pejorative or congratulatory of the French history? I've done quite a bit of reading on this, Prune, and, and um, I'm not entirely clear on that. I do know it was introduced to California after being sold to a trader there in the year 1898. Right. And it wasn't called improved French then. It was called something else. So maybe they did improve it slightly with, mm. with, a, bit of, uh, with a bit of breeding. Of course, the, the fun thing about prunes in America is in 2001, the United States Food and Drug Administration approved a renaming of prunes to dried plums. Because there was a feeling in the prune industry that the word prune has a bit of stigma (laughs) associated with, you know, constipation and bowel movements and things like that. So I don't know whether we should be calling this dried plum of the week, but I'm going to stick with prune of the week. (laughs) It's tradition. Stick with tradition. Prune of the week. Yeah. I mean, the the French improved is a a late season prune. You're looking at late July to mid to late August. It's medium sized. 
It's got a long oval shape, about the size of an egg, very egg-shaped, mm. with a, a glaucous, a dark, purplish plum skin. It's got a sweet, mild-flavoured flesh, juicy interior, bright orange apricot colour inside, and as with most prune varieties of plum, it's a freestone to semi-freestone pit. So the pit comes out quite easily for when you're making prunes. Your, your eating plums have got the more fixed pit. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a good freestone pit. What do you mean it comes out easy? Does it mean it breaks apart easy? It's soft? Or do you mean it just comes out easy? I think it comes out easily when you go through the prune drying process. Right. You know? I don't know if you remove the pit before or after you do the drying. If there are any dried plum or prune makers out there, let us know. Mm. The, the, the plant was traditionally used in French orchards, hence the name, not just for the lovely fruit, but it was also a very useful windbreak, having some, some of these uh, plants there. It was a good, it's a good windbreaking plant. How, how ironic. Uh, that... As in blocking the wind, not farting. Prunes <laughs> 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 have been used to stop wind as much as to be blamed for causing yeah. it. Hmm. So anyway, nice. One of the real classic prune there for prune of the week. Can you can you still get the French improved in France, or is it only to be found in California now? Oh, I would imagine you can still get it in France. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm pretty sure it is the it is the dominant plum prune, right? Plum used for prunes. So I imagine it's pretty international. But I mean, California is where it's at. All right. Well, yeah. You're the master. All right. Thank you for the French Improved on this edition of Prune of the Week. Now it's the time for us to uh, do our winners. We've got an unmade podcast spoon, not a prune, <laughs> uh, which we are going to be giving to one of our Patreon supporters, and that is Norman G. Can you guess what country Norman G is from? Norman G from Canada? You are right. This is wow. from Canada. Congratulations. <laughs> Canadians just clean up when it comes to these. I promise it's random. I don't know if we have a particularly high number of Canadian patrons, but they absolutely clean up on the prizes. A sofa shop mixtape is going to Richard D from Washington State. I wonder if he's related to Heavy D from Heavy D and the Boys. Or Tenacious, <laughs> Tenacious, or Tenacious D. D. Wow, they could have, yeah. they could have a, yeah. a big family reunion. And we are giving... Spoon of the Week collector cards to Magnus from Norway, Michael A. from Virginia in the US, mm -hmm. and Tyler Q. from Victoria in Australia. Ah, fantastic. I've just come back from Victoria, and it's a great state. Wonderful state, Is Victoria. It? Oh, it's lovely. It's lush. Is it better than South Australia? I, I think it's it's got a hell of a, heck of a lot more rain, yes. So... <laughs> 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 it's actually got some rain, which is one thing. So everything's green. It's a beautiful state. Well, speaking of things that are beautiful, would you like to hear my idea for a podcast? Yes. You don't get to use the Jurassic Park music. You have to do it naked. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, okay, I'll give it my best. So my idea is based on a word or a part of a word that is al always amuses me. It just always tickles me. And that is the word... Munger. Hmm. M-O-N-G-E-R. As in a fishmonger. Oh, yes. Yeah. Hmm. So, I, my idea is, is called, well, we'll call it podmongers. Mm. And basically, it's a lot like my idea I had, um, the ology idea, where we talk about all different ologies, you know. Yeah. Biology and that, psychology and that. This time, it's just podcast episodes, and each one is about a different kind of munger. <laughs> where you talk to someone who's in that trade. Because munger traditionally means like a dealer or a trader, a peddler, someone who sells things. So the, what mungers spring to your mind? There are three that spring to my mind when I think of mungers. Fishmonger, of course. Fishmonger comes to mind because uh, uh, reading the Asterix books when I was a kid, there was a very famous uh, fishmonger there. And then mm. um, ironmonger comes to mind for some yes, reason. That's yeah. that, yep, ironmonger is one of my three, yep. There are three main ones, the ironmonger, the fishmonger, and the other one that I come across a little bit, maybe because there's one in Bristol, is a cheesemonger. Oh, right, That's of another course. kind of monger yes. you get. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think they're the three classic mongers we still have. And every time I see the word monger, every time we walk past this cheesemonger, I always have a little titter to myself and start coming up with other, make jokes to my wife that she doesn't find funny about all the other jobs that could be mongers. Mm. Um, but some other, some other ones that, 
that do exist but aren't used so much anymore. A pelt monger or a fell monger is someone who sells skins. Very appropriate after Peter's oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, earlier, earlier message. A costa monger is someone who sells fruit, which was not a term I knew. It's no. quite an old term from like Shakespearean times. It used to apply mainly to apples, which I think is where costa monger comes from. That was an, a type of apple or an apple word, but it can be used just for a fruit seller. Uh, a relic monger, someone who sells relics. Old yes. objects. Uh, but there were many other kinds of mongers, but it seems to be dying out. I was thinking, what would we be? Would I be a video monger? I'm not <laughs> sure. Is that my job? And I was wondering, would you be a god monger or a salvation monger? Yes, gospel monger. That's, that's right. Gospel monger. <laughs> <laughs> that's, very, that's very good. I yeah. quite like that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> gospel monger. You should get some business cards done. <laughs> Tim Hine, gospel monger. <laughs> <laughs> established 1999 or something like that yeah, yeah yeah that's cool so i'd love to just interview mongers oh it's a good idea it's a good idea the other one that comes to mind um that's used a little bit kind of pejoratively is is warmonger when someone like putin going to war is a warmonger yeah yes yes and a fearmonger fearmonger who, yes one, Yes, so we have mm. warmongers and fearmongers. They could also be featured on my podcast. Wow. I also um, did a bit of research into people with the surname Munger. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, do, do any spring to your mind? I would, I would be surprised if you knew any, but there was one I did know, but and there was a few others. I thought Ironmonger came to mind because there was a 1980s footballer called someone Ironmonger. Ooh, there I'm was thinking two. North Melbourne, maybe? You're right. Yes, you're right. Good call. Good memory. I I seem to remember that. Uh, John Ironmonger. Yes, there, there yes. we go. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Played for North Melbourne and for Sydney. He was a ruckman from memory. Is that right? Yeah, or he for- was big lumbering. He was a big lumbering dude. Yeah, <laughs> there he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not the kind of player you see much anymore. Cause- no, no, that's right. He couldn't run. He's, it's really funny. The key facts have come up here. Like, he's obviously a big, intimidating guy. And it's his full name, John Ironmonger. And it's just known as, which is obviously where they put the nickname, and they've just got John Ironmonger. Like, no, no one dared give him a nickname. <laughs> Love it. People who are big fans of motor racing, particularly in the UK, may know the na- name of a young man named Billy Munger who was a young up-and-coming racing car driver. Mm. He had a really bad crash in the UK and had to have both of his legs amputated. And he's still, like, involved in racing and commentating, and he's a real great story of resilience that he hasn't, he hasn't let it, you know, diminish him or cower him, but it was, a, it was also a tr- tragedy. But So people will know the name Billy Munger. All right. Uh, Adrian Munger was an Australian rower who competed at the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne, won a bronze medal in the men's eight. Christopher Munger is a Welsh screenwriter and director, best known for the Englishman who went up a hill and came down a mountain. Oh, that Hugh Grant film. Yeah, right. Yeah. Frederick Charles Munger was a a businessman and politician in Western Australia, uh, in the Western Australian Legislative Assembly, and him and his father were both elected to Parliament in Western Australia, which was a, I think they were the first people to do that, first father and son pair. Uh, and as a result, there's actually a lake in Perth named Lake Munger, which I'm assuming is named after them. <laughs> Very popular bird watching location, and also a place where lots of people seem to drown from my investigations. <laughs> right. Uh, George Munger was an Englishman who won the Victoria Cross in the 1800s for bravery on the battlefield. And the one I thought you may have known, because you know a lot about music, is Tom Munger, who's a harpist with Florence and the Machine. No. I've heard of Florence and the Machine, but I'm not big on harpists. Mm. No. No. But harpists is another good idea for a podcast. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. Harp mongers. <laughs> oh, they're very good. Uh, many strings to my bow. Oh, very good. <laughs> uh, there we go. Mongers. I would invite various traders and peddlers and salespeople onto my podcast and talk to them about their mongering. What does it take to be an iron monger or a cheese monger? Mm. When did you decide to embrace the term monger? What about farmers? What a f- what's a farmer? Are they a an animal monger or an 
a, a, a dirt monger. Cow mongers. I, I, I think the thing that comes before the monger is traditionally the thing you're selling. You could be a milk monger. Milk monger. Yeah, that's, that's got a nice mm. ring to it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it does indeed. Or an egg monger. Beef monger. Beef monger. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Sheep monger. It's funny that news monger, if a journalist, news monger, would have, uh, you'd think that would catch on. I like that. It's a bit that's of a good. news. I like news we, we go, You go with news hound, I guess. That's the one that's always yeah. attached to them, isn't it? And can mm. I just say, if monger is one of your daughter's secret words this week, we have well and truly delivered the goods. <sighs> Yeah, I would say put on the Jurassic Park music, but no, no, it's not. No. But <laughs> do, do you know what one is? What? Plum. <laughs> You're joking. I'm not even joking. Have a look at that. Well, where is it? That is amazing. <laughs> that I've is got amazing. a little note, a note here that I found next to my keys as I left, and it's got two yeah. words on it. One of them's plum, and the other one, there's a little note that says, don't bother coming home if you don't say it. <laughs> Kiss, kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and I see there's a second word there, and you have used that word as well. I'm very proud. Yes. Well nice. done. <laughs> I can't believe... When I brought up Prune of the Week and started talking about plums, were you, like, thinking, oh, my God, this is amazing? No, I was going... <laughs> I, I, I was. I've been sitting on my excitement for a while, but I thought I'd get it out in case I was. I know I was just as likely to get through this whole episode with you saying it and get to the end, and then me have forgotten <laughs> to say it with you. So I've absolutely uh, made sure I did it before I told you. Brilliant, brilliant. I can't believe Plum was one of because the do you know do you know do you know why? Because I'm a I'm a I'm a um a, a forgetting monger. I'm a, I'm. A <laughs> <laughs> Memory monger. <laughs> memory. <laughs> bad, bad memory monger. <laughs> Unlike the guy, what's his name? Grant, isn't it, in Jurassic Park, who takes off his glasses. He's a dinosaur monger. Dr. Grant. Dr. Grant, yeah. yeah. He's a bones monger. Mm. He's a b- bone monger. <laughs> bone monger. <laughs> and what's Hammond? Hammond is a dinosaur monger. <laughs> He's a dino monger. monger. Dino, dino yeah. monger. There's something, do you know why the munger, munger, what does it sound like that makes it sound distasteful? It sounds like, it doesn't sound. It does, you're right, it's an, it sounds unnice. It's got the same problem that I think the prune industry is reviling against, that it's associated with things. Prune sounds like prudish, but um, mm. monger sounds, what does it sound like? Mongrel? Yeah, yeah I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that? Yeah. Well, although I thought mongrel would have been just an Australianism, really, but perhaps. No, I think mongrel is an international word for a mixed breed dog. Oh, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, well, there we go. I think we're done. Mongers. Well done, man. You're a monger monger. I am. I'm an ideas monger. <laughs> You're an ideas monger. <laughs> <laughs> Plum, plum, plums, plums, plum, plums, plum, plums, plum, 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 pl